This is Dave Dickinson here at AstroGuys.com. And I just wanted to tell you guys out there in fan land about a very special event that's going to be occurring Tuesday morning. Uh, for East Coasters, it's going to be occurring right around starting 1 a.m. up until about sunrise. There is going to be a total lunar eclipse. It's going to be one of the last lunar eclipses uh, and eclipses for the year, for that matter, in astronomical events for this year. It's going to fall right on the morning of the 21st uh, for viewers. Uh, some viewers is going to fall on the 20th, uh, right before uh, midnight. West Coast and Hawaii and areas out there in the Pacific are going to be seeing it. Uh, Asia, they're going to be seeing it right there at sunset, which is on the other side of the time, the international date line. But here on the East Coast, we're going to be seeing it right here past midnight. And up to that, for guys, we're going to be up photographing this eclipse. Now, the partial phase for the eclipse, the moon is going to enter the umbra at 1.33 a.m. And the totality is going to go from 2.41 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 3.53 a.m. It's going to last for about 72 minutes. Now, you're going to see uh, the penumbral a little past midnight. Penumbral, you might notice like maybe a little bit of shading on the moon as it enters in. Uh, maybe it'll look a little light, light brownish, but you're not really going to see that sharp, sharp edge of the shadow until it enters into the umbra right there at about uh, 1.33 a.m. It's interesting to time that, too, and see exactly when it starts happening. The partial phase is going to end right about 5.01 uh, Eastern Standard Time. And about 15 hours later, I'm sure you're seeing, everyone's saying that this is the lunar eclipse that's occurring right during the winter solstice. And it's like the only one in our lifetime. Well, that's true for about maybe one third of the planet. That one third being mostly North America, um, continental North America in time zones associated with such. Uh, in Europe, the uh, solstice is going to occur after. Uh, solstice is about 15 hours after, uh, like, central time totality, give, give or take a few minutes. So, yes, this is a winter solstice eclipse for a portion of the planet, for North America. Uh, the first, the, this has been the, only the second winter solstice eclipse. Back, I combed through the records when I was doing a blog post associated with this, uh, since 1638, uh, is the only time in AD, since, like, 0 AD that there's been another winter solstice eclipse and there's not another one till we actually don't have to wait that long again there's not going to be another one till 2094 i'm probably not going to be around that time maybe um some of the kids might be around in 2094 and i'm going to let say maybe i'll say uh take my brain and put it in a jar by then or find a way to download my consciousness in my laptop finally i probably won't be around in 2094 so it'll be the only winter solstice eclipse for myself and of course saying winter solstice meaning Northern Hemisphere Solstice. Uh, I know this is the summer solstice for any of you down under watching this. Um, the next total lunar eclipse, uh, this is only the, the only good Northern uh, North American total lunar eclipse that you're going to see until about 2014, April 15th. Uh, there's not really any good uh, lunar eclipses that are going to cover all of North America. Uh, in 2012 and 2013. So uh, get out there and see this one, definitely, because it's uh, going to be the last one for over um, three years. Uh, an interesting thing to look at, I'm going to be out photographing this eclipse. I'll probably be doing it through my 8-inch telescope, and I'll be piggybacking the digital SLR to do wide field shots as well. And I'll be tweeting this out. You follow me at, uh, at AstroGuys. Uh, that's AstroGuys with a Z. We'll try to put it in the notes in the show. And... When you're looking at and photographing this eclipse, I would, if you're not familiar with photographing the moon, you might have the equipment to do it. You don't necessarily need a giant telescope. Uh, you can watch this eclipse with the naked eye. Uh, you might not need a giant telescope to photograph it. Uh, you can use, if you got a digital SLR with a decent zoom, and you can set your time exposures to, say, down like, you know, tenth of a second, twentieth of a second. You're going to be wanting to put on manual and vary those shots because the moon is going to change brightness as you're shooting. Now, there's a lot of talk about what is known as the Denjon number as far as the darkness of this eclipse. I am predicting this eclipse is going to be fairly dark, although we may be surprised. Some eclipses are very bright, very coppery to yellow, pumpkin kind of colors. 
the moon turns red because it's entering into the Earth's shadow, and it's turning red because it's getting all that light filtered in through the atmosphere of the Earth and going by it and then shining down on the moon. Now, I'm going to predict that this one's going to be kind of dark because we had a lot of volcanic eruptions like the famous, um, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but the uh, Icelandic volcano that erupted earlier this year, uh, that there are probably still a lot of ash and dust up there in the atmosphere. So we'll see if this one's going to be fairly dark, uh, where sometimes the moon even almost disappears when it enters into the Earth's shadow. We'll start seeing, the moon's going to be right around the constellation Gemini, at the feet of Gemini. Uh, when it enters into the Earth's shadow, and you may see uh, a lot of stars come out uh, that are no longer light blue washed out by the moon. Also note, there is what's known as the Ursid meteor shower uh, for North American viewers that peaks the next morning after the eclipse, and they may be active that morning. And the whole upshoot of this is you may see some Ursid meteors at that time when the eclipse is occurring. Uh, rates have been kind of enhanced with the Ursus. Usually they're a very unknown, like only people that are really into meteor showers even bother to go up. See these are not like the Geminids or the Parasids. Uh, they're like 5 to 10 per hour, which is really a great rate. The Ursids lately have been creeping up for 20 to 30, and on very odd years they've been known to be up toward maybe 80 per hour. So you never know. We might get a enhanced meteor rate. Uh, during this lunar eclipse, the moon's eclipse, we may see a few meteors actually pop out. An interesting thing to look for, if you're in an area where the moon is setting or rising during the eclipse, is what's called as a, as a selenellium. Selenellium, <laughs> quite a tongue roller, is when you see the total eclipse moon above the horizon when the sun is above the horizon as well. Now you ask yourself, how could that be possible if the eclipse moon always has the opposite of the sun? Well, keep in mind that the Earth's shadow isn't precisely um, the size of the moon as viewed from the Earth. Uh, as viewed from the Earth. It's about three times the diameter of the moon. The moon appears roughly about 30 arc minutes, but one half a degree in diameter. And the Earth's shadow appears roughly in an area about three times that size. So it is possible that the moon is still kind of hung up in that shadow as you're right in the right position on the Earth as the sun is coming up over the horizon. So you may have both above the horizon at the same time. You have your own, uh, your own personal selenellium going on. So you see the moon the eclipse at the same time. You're going to see this in areas like either in Europe, North Africa, or Far East Asia for this eclipse. You're not going to see this in North America because the eclipse is going to be high up in the sky. As a matter of fact, right around Southern California and Baja California, uh, the eclipse moon is going to be very close to right at the zenith and overhead. Areas that you're going to see this kind of effect is going, are going to be where the moon is either setting or rising as this eclipse. Okay, I've never seen it before either. It's an elusive thing to see, but I'd like to know if any of you guys actually see this during the eclipse. I'd like to hear from you. One cool tip, when you're trying to estimate the moon's magnitude, this is something I've done over the years, uh, when it's interesting to try to estimate what its brightness is while the moon is being eclipsed. And a very unconventional method I found that actually works to do this is to view the moon, the moon through pair of binoculars reversed. What you're doing is you're looking through the binoculars the wrong way. You know, probably the only time you'll ever do this, uh, when you're sober anyway. And you'll be looking at the moon and it will focus the moon down to a star-like point when it's eclipsed. And the trick is, is to compare that star-like point to other stars up there, uh, Castor, Pollux, Auriga, uh, I mean, Auriga the constellations, Capella, you know, other stars that are up and try to say, okay, the moon is the, the reversed moon focused down is the equivalent of these other stars up there. And you can get a good estimate of what the magnitude is. And that's something amateurs still do every eclipse because the eclipsed moon, looking at the coloration of the eclipse, is not the same from one eclipse to another. Sometimes, as I said, we said the Danjon number is very dark and sometimes it's very bright. Now, looking at it from one eclipse to another, this actually tells us how much dust, how much aerosols are suspended. It tells us a lot of things about these uh, particular eclipses. Okay. And in closing, I'm going to put up right after this a simulation that I did in Starry Night. These are both from the East Coast. 
One is uh, the eclipse as viewed from the East Coast, and the other is going to be the eclipse as viewed from the moon. Kind of neat. I do these in Starry Night and a little bit more data on the eclipse. So uh, get out there and enjoy and tell me what you think.